Eric Cannon has very kindly brought me down to Worthing to meet his good friend and Nat Poe National winner, Jed Jackson of Worthing. This man is an incredible fancier as he's blind and has won the ultimate race, the Poe National. Thanks very much for inviting me around today to see your birds, Jed. And I must say, I've been waiting to say, wanting to say this for years. Congratulations on your fantastic performance from the Pro National. That was a few years ago, but I've always admired that. It's an incredible, incredible performance. Well, it is a long time ago, Keith. It's now, I mean, it was in 1980. But it was most marvellous, you know. The events of that weekend, I will never, ever forget. You know, no, people, have had you, uh, people have said to me, you know, how marvellous that was for you to get to win the poor national. But, you know, when I look back in my meditative moments, I don't remember poor as the best remembered occasion of pigeons. I go back to my call house days when I had four nest boxes in the upper half of our call house. And that's what I remember best about pigeons. Yeah. Although, to win the poor national, it's a very, very great honor. And, uh, yeah, it's beyond belief. I mean, for a normal fan, it's on beyond belief, Jed, but for you, it was fantastic. Well, it was, you know, and when, and when, when I won the poor national, I was talking to some friends of mine in the Midlands, and, They'd been talking and they said, well, where the hell do we go from here? And our blind man's won the poor national. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So yeah. I say, you still love your birds just as much as the days you did then, it makes... Well, yes, yeah. you know, they're, they're, these pigeons with me, as, as, well, as you possibly know, and everybody else does, they've been the saving grace of my blind life. Yeah. You know, pigeons serve me best as social currency. Yeah. And without the pigeons, I could well be uh, find myself in the bloody, uh, in the knacker yard, so to speak. Yeah. They've given, they've given purpose to a life, yeah. and they bring me down that garden path a thousand times in the day. That's and it. That is most important, you know, and yeah. to have an interest like that. Yes, I could have so easily have finished up in the bloody dust bowl of society, but yeah. the pigeons. They have, they, they have been the saving grace of my blind life. This hen, Keith, won me Thurso about three or four years ago. She is a granddaughter of Janista, which won me the Paul National in 1980. And she is rather a special hen because she spends so much time on my shoulder when, when I'm in the loft. And she came onto that board on the morning, turned about seven o'clock, I opened the flap, and she came straight onto my shoulder. She didn't go into a nest box, and I just picked her off my shoulder and turned her. She's a lovely hen, so a she's very, lovely very nice, pigeons. very yeah, nice yeah. temperament she's got too. That's a nice looking pigeon, that one, Jed. It's a, it's, a, it's a very nice bird, Keith, and of course it goes back to Janista, a lovely pigeon to handle, so gentle, lovely temperament. He's flown poor four times, Thurso three times, and he has been twice second at Thurso. And like most of my birds, he's so gentle, so quiet. That's it, Jed. You fly North Road and South Road. North Road and South. Road. The same pigeons, yeah. I, send, I turn them round and they say that you can't, but you know, when I won the poor national Keith with Janista, I sent it to Berwick and turned around. She had five weeks rest between Berwick and Paul and she came along and she won the Paul National. Well, that's proof then, is it, Jed? And the following yeah. year, we had two Berwicks in our Federation programme, and I had several calls from fanciers asking me which Berwick I was going to send my poor pigeons to. Yeah. I said, I'm not going to send them to either. They said, what you did last year, you recorded in the book of saying that you said, I said, yes, I did. But I said, if I thought she was going to win the Port National, I wouldn't let her out of the bloody loft. No, I would send her to Berwick. This is a scene inside Jed's old bird section. Do you fly only natural, Jed? I fly only natural. I find it's most suitable to me. I've had them come down here and suggest to me, Jed, it would be ideal for you 
and uh, the, to, to fly this widowed system is that they knock you, there's another one gone through. They say they knock you over when they come to the lot. Well, I've always thought the most important thing about pigeon racing is getting them there first before you trap them, and I have no problems, and it suits me, and I'm too old to change, and I won't change. And from what I've heard, from the lads who do it and talk about it, it wouldn't interest me in the least. Uh, how many old bird pairs you keep in Well, I, <coughs> I, I never go more than about 18 pairs, and that is sufficient for me. I can manage 18 pairs, and I know them all. I can tell them all by their skeletal structure, every one of them. And there's nothing particularly clever about that. Any blind person could, would be able to do that if they were sufficiently interested in that side of in the sport. But it's just something, you know. What I could see in my sighted days, my fingertips tell me today, they are my sight today, the fingertips. And I don't really miss too much, I can tell you, the moment I come into this loft, if there's a stray pigeon in here, yes. no problem at all. When do you pair your pigeons up? I pair them up, I never pair them up till about the middle of March. I don't touch them before. Yeah, are you mostly interested in longer races, in Jim? Just the longer races, that's what interests me, you know. I don't understand all this business now, with all these shorter distance races, that, but it doesn't appeal to me, you know. John Langston, who won the Poor National, he was a great, a great friend of mine, we corresponded regularly, you know, and he believed, as I do too, that use for pigeon racing doesn't start until you get to 250 miles. But, um, Oh, well, Jeb, well, I'd like to hear about your national winner, Janista, from Poe, which was, I'll say again, it was a fantastic performance. Well, thank you, Keith, for those kind words. But, you know, it was absolutely marvellous for me to win the poor national, you know. And although, although it's such a significant performance, it's not what I remember best about pigeons when I look back in my meditative moments in the solitude of my lounge. I tell you what I remember best about pigeons. My coal house days in the north of England when I had four nest boxes in the upper part of my coal house. And I used to service these pigeons in coal dust, ankle deep in coal dust. And then I won the poor national and I, Christ, I was ankle deep in stardust. It was absolutely marvellous. And on the day that she came, there were two fanciers sitting up there on the patio with me and they said there's a pigeon coming up from the sea jet. I said, well, watch it, watch it and it came, it landed on the board, and we timed it. And you know, one of the things I miss about pigeons now, and I remember it, is to see a pigeon from three or 400 feet shut its wings and stoop to the loft, spilling air as it comes, that's it. And if, if the good Lord in his omnifference was to grant me three minutes of sight, I think it would have to be a pigeon plummeting for its board home after a 14 or 15 hour flight. It's a marvelous thing to see. But now, although I can't appreciate that today, whenever a pigeon lands on that board today and I hear the flurry of beating wings, wind, wings, it sets the adrenaline flow and it excites me just the same. It dries up all the bloody saliva in my mouth. This love, I love these birds. They, they're going to have a hard old flight here today. They've been flying now four hours and three quarters. Um, mm, there's uh, not much wind. I'll tell you what, they're going to be very hot. They're going to be very tired when these birds get back in. Yes, they want yeah. a long drink. Have you popped up the drinker? Yeah, I'll put some water in the drink. Fresh you? water. There's nothing wrong with this bird up here. Listen to him. He never stops, <laughs> does he? He, he doesn't does. be, he's, he's enjoying it up there. Mm. I think I'd better be getting down into that loft, don't you? Yes. I think you should. Well, they, sh they should be here within the next 10 minutes, I think. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or that about. So I'll get myself down there. <whistles> I just finished my service with the RAF and came out, and I'd only been demobbed a few months when I met with a road accident which completely severed the optic nerve. <whistles> These pigeons here, they've, um, They've done a wonderful job for me, these birds. I, um, they've given purpose to a life which might so easily have finished up on the human scrap heap. You know, they've, um, they've done such a, a good job for me. 
And I think it would be true to say that they have been the salvation of my blind life. For I've always had either rabbits, dogs, birds or pigeons in my sighted life. And I thought, well, there's a desperate need now for a hobby. And um, I thought about it quite a lot. As a matter of fact, I gave a deep, great deal of thought to it whilst I was laying in hospital. And I decided that perhaps that pigeons would offer me the most since you can handle the pigeons. I decided that I would build my own lot. I came home from work and such was my enthusiasm. I threw the harness from my guide dog up under the coal bunker, got into a pair of dungarees, went down to the bottom of the garden and started building on my lot. And when I set to, uh, the, the blueprint was just in my mind's eye and I hammered into the night until sometimes two and three in the morning, quite unconscious of the darkness that had come down. By the time I'd finished, to show for it, I had three bandaged fingers and lost the goodwill of my neighbours <laughs> through bagging all night. <laughs> now, in 1980, I was waiting for pigeons from the Four National and my wife said to me, she said, here's a pigeon coming. And you know, this is absolutely poetry to see a pigeon after a 14 hour flight, shut its wings and plummet for the board, spilling air. It's a most wonderful thing. Of course, I can no longer appreciate that. But when I hear the flurry of wings, it sets the adrenaline flowing and the heart thumps and the mouth dries. And it's a most wonderful feeling. Well, I didn't realize at that time that I was timing in the winner of the national race. I came down here, I got her into the clock, took the rubbers from her leg, got her into the clock, and my goodness, it very quickly became obvious as the afternoon wore on that I was winning the creme de la creme of all pigeon classics, which is the Paul Grand National. Now that is flown from the south of France, and there was 5,884 birds competing, and I was beside myself with excitement, and for some 10 days, I, I was stupefied by the incomprehensible belief that I had won the, the, the poor national. It was something I'll never forget. I laid awake at night on my bed, laid awake, and I just allowed the sweetness of success to flow over me. I laid awake so that I could savor it to the full. It was a most wonderful feeling. But very sadly, you've come to see me on the day when Janista which is my reputation has been made by. She died this morning of heart failure between five and six. And I have laid her to rest beneath that beautiful shove at the end of the loft here. And she's laid to rest there under the Janista tree from which she took her name. And that is what we christen the Janista. Most wonderful pigeon. And I'm very, very sad about it all, as you can naturally appreciate.